both Moscow and NATO have so-called red lines that could trigger outright war between them. The conflict in Ukraine now involves many countries with Western weapons being used against Russia. So are these red lines shifting? And is there a greater risk of a wider war? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Fully Batibo. Russia has launched its biggest attack of the war in Ukraine this year, killing at least 50 people, while Ukrainian forces have hit targets in Russia. Kyiv's forces remain in Russian territory in the Kyrgyz region after crossing the border a month ago. The biggest conflict in Europe since World War II has brought Russia and the West closer than ever to direct confrontation. Russia says it's already fighting a proxy war against NATO, whose members are arming Ukraine, yet the White House has said it doesn't want war with Russia. So what are the so-called red lines for each side? And could breaking them lead to outright war between Russia and NATO? We'll be discussing this with our guests shortly, but first this report from Sarah Khairat. Body bags carried away in Lviv, a city in western Ukraine close to the border with NATO member Poland. An injured man, one of dozens, is comforted, while people cry as they look at the enormous damage done to a historical neighborhood. We'll move residents of at least six buildings to other places. Two schools and two medical centers were damaged. It's tough. Several people died in this latest Russian bombing less than 24 hours after the highest number were killed in a single attack this year. On the other side of the country, the city of Poltava was hit by two ballistic missiles, killing more than 50 people and injuring hundreds. Russia will be held accountable. And once again, we urge everyone in the world who has the power to stop this terror. Air defense systems and missiles are needed in Ukraine, not in a warehouse somewhere. Long-range strikes that can defend against Russian terror are needed now, not sometime later. Every day of delay, unfortunately, means more lives lost. Ukraine's incursion into the western region of Kursk nearly a month ago took Russia by complete surprise. The risky cross-border move was the most significant and bold since Russia invaded Ukraine in 2022. Ukrainian soldiers have occupied dozens of villages across more than a thousand square meters. We want to make this uh, training mission as pragmatic and easy as possible. The EU's top diplomat has pressured Ukraine's international backers to allow strikes on targets inside Russia. The EU, previously largely seen as an economic and political trading bloc, is now intensively involved in training Ukrainian soldiers. It is the most successful training mission that the European Union has ever performed. It has trained 60,000 soldiers. And today the ministers agreed on raising the purpose, the target, to 75,000, adding 15,000 more by the end of the year. This is also a good news. We'll do more if Ukraine is requesting. This war requires a constant adaptation to the modalities of the war. Russian President Vladimir Putin has again warned Ukraine and its allies. We can't allow hostile structures to be created near us, which hatch aggressive plans against us and constantly try to destabilize the Russian Federation. Discussions have been held in the Kremlin about changing Russia's nuclear doctrine to allow the possibility of using nuclear weapons. French President Emmanuel Macron has also floated the possibility of Western troops being sent to fight in Ukraine. That notion's been dismissed by its partners in NATO, at least for now. Sara Khairat, Al Jazeera for Inside Story. Well, Western nations have shifted their policy on the uh, supply and use of their weapons by Ukraine. The U.S. first aimed to assist Ukraine but avoid war in Russia. Yet it's now supplied it with around $175 billion worth of aid, including military supplies since the war began. 
Those arms were first restricted to use on Ukrainian territory. That changed in May when President Joe Biden said targets in Russia could be hit if linked to defending the city of Kharkiv. Since May, France and the UK agreed to allow storm shadow missiles to include targets inside Russia for defensive purposes instead of solely inside Ukrainian territory. Germany initially refused to allow its Leopard tanks to be supplied to Ukraine. Chancellor Olaf Scholz U-turned on that in January last year. And after initial reluctance, the U.S. sent Atakam's missiles to the country. Short-range versions given a year ago switched to longer-range versions in April that can strike targets 300 kilometers away. The U.S. says they can't be used offensively inside Russia, but they've been used to attack Russian annex Crimea. Ukraine has repeatedly asked for advanced Western aircraft. Again, after initial reluctance, President Joe Biden allowed F-16 fighter jets to be sent, with the first batch arriving in July. Well, let's bring in now our guests for today's show. In Moscow, Dmitry Babich is the deputy foreign editor of the Komsomolskaya Pravda newspaper. In Kyiv, Peter Zalmayev is the executive D director of the Eurasia Democracy Initiative. And in Berlin, Ben Aris, editor of Business News Europe. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Thank you very much for joining us on Inside Story. Peter, uh, in Kyiv, let me start with you. President Zelensky has asked Western leaders to ignore President Putin's so-called red lines. After the attack uh, on Tuesday, Ukraine is now asking for more powerful weapons and the right to use them deep into Russian territory. First of all, how much concern is there in Kyiv today that support may drop as this war grinds on? That's been our you know, perennial sort of concern and fear simply because we're dealing with uh, electoral democracies, unlike uh, Vladimir Putin's Russia and his uh, allies, Iran and China and uh, North Korea. And so there are these vagaries of uh, electoral democracies where different uh, political forces come to power with different ideas about who to uh, support or if to support allies at all. Uh, so that's always a concern, will remain a concern the money uh, that the U.S. Congress has uh, appropriated a few months ago is still there. Uh, much will depend on who, once again, gets elected in November. Uh, but be that as it may, I think NATO continues to send signals that it simply cannot afford to let Ukraine uh, mm -hmm. fall. At the same time, having said this, with this continuing terror against civilian areas, today uh, seven people dead in Lviv, uh, the day before yesterday, Poltava, over 50 people dead. Ukraine mm. needs to boost mm. air defense systems as soon as possible, and we need to get uh, finally this permission to strike at uh, Russian targets deep inside the territory, territory of Russia, to strike at these missile complexes before yeah. they are fired. I was going to ask you, Peter, specifically, which weapons does Ukraine want today uh, to use inside Russia, and how is it going to use them? Well, in fact, we're already using the same weapons. So we're talking about Atakams missiles, uh, for one. We just need to have a longer-range Atakams missile that uh, the U.S. would give. Uh, Ukraine has identified jointly with its uh, uh, Western allies uh, as many as 250 such potentially crucial sites uh, inside Russia's territory, the neutralization, the destructions of which, while mm -hmm. not put an end to this war, will significantly hamper Russia's uh, continuing designs to destroy Ukraine. OK, let's get the Russian perspective. Uh, Dmitry Babich in Moscow, Ukraine has said that the Kremlin's uh, threats of retaliation are nothing but a bluff. A and by invading Russia itself last month, uh, as we saw the, the offensive into uh, Kursk, Ukraine, it was thought, had crossed all of the red lines of Russia, and yet there was no reaction from Moscow. Why is that? Well, I don't think there was no reaction from Moscow. Uh, of course, uh, this was uh, an escalation on the side of the Ukrainian government. Uh, let me tell you that basically uh, this area was a peaceful uh, was a peaceful area during these uh, two years, uh, two, year, two and a half years of the war. Uh, there was a kind of an agreement, a uh, gentleman's agreement, a tacit agreement between Russia and Ukraine that the main fighting is uh, going to be fought in Donbass, uh, which is uh, populated by ethnic Russians and which had been 
a problem, a uh, political problem for Ukraine for many years. So uh, the fact that now uh, Belgorod, Kursk, two Russian border regions are bombarded uh, by Ukrainian drones, sometimes by Ukrainian missiles, of course, this is bringing new uh, escalation to this war, just uh, as well as the attacks by attack MS missiles against Crimea. Right. Uh, Dimitri, what, what are the, sorry, Dimitri, let me just ask you, what are Russia's red lines today? They seem to have shifted so, so many times in the course of this conflict. W what is today the ultimate red line for Moscow? Well, the problem is that uh, uh, the West continues to pressure Russia. It has been pressuring Russia since the early 90s, forcing us uh, to adopt new red lines. Uh, let me remind you that uh, the crossing of the red line started in 1994, 1993, when President Clinton, despite previous promises by the United States, uh, announced that NATO would expand. Uh, and uh, since then, Russia had to move its red lines further and further to the east. Mm. Uh, uh, of course, Russia is weaker than NATO. So one of the ways for Russia to defend itself is to have a strong presidential power, just like uh, in the United States, uh, presidential powers increased during the uh, 20th century. The Congress no longer has uh, the power to um, declare war. The president can start the war without consulting with the Congress. In the same way, in Russia, presidential powers increased and red lines became blurred because this is one of the ways uh, to... Uh, resist a stronger opponent. You okay. do not uh, show your cards. You do not so, uh, uh, immediately announce uh, uh, what you will do. But so, in the so West blurred position, red lines, certain, you say, as a strategy I, I, I for Russia. Add, I want to finish it. It's very important. Uh, in the Western position, there is a very important contradiction. At the same time, the Western media and the Western politicians say that Russia is unpredictable, that President Putin is dangerous. Uh, you never know what he will do. And at the same time, uh, they say he's not going to do anything. Uh, just don't be afraid of him. Uh, strike Russia deep inside its territory. If nothing happens to NATO countries before that, nothing will happen in the future. So in that sense, the West is behaving irresponsibly. And there is a huge gap between uh, propaganda, uh, you know, demonizing Russia and the actions uh, which are, uh, uh, you know, which have been taken as if Russia uh, mm. would never put up any resistance. All this right. has already led us deep, deep into this terrible conflict, which is a tragedy for both Russia and Ukraine. Ben, let me bring you into the conversation. Dmitry said there that the, the West is uh, behaving irresponsibly. Ukraine, as we've heard, is asking for more powerful weapons from, from NATO, from Western allies. What are the chances that uh, Ukraine's allies will do as President Zelensky is asking and, and loosen the restrictions that have been in place so far? It's confused. I mean, you've got, on the one hand, you've got Borrell, uh, the foreign minister, effectively, of the EU, saying, like, give them the weapons, let them strike deep into Russian territory. On the other hand, you've got Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor, saying that our policy hasn't changed and that we won't give that permission. And I think to understand what's lying behind this, we, we should be clear about what we mean by red lines. What, mm -hmm. what happens if you cross that? What is this ultimate red line? And Jens um, Stoltenberg, the Secretary General of NATO, said at the very beginning of the conflict, we have two priorities. The first one, or the second one, is to aid Ukraine and, and not let it get defeated by Russia. But the first one is to avoid World War III. And right. this red line, right. if you cross it, what, what's lying behind this is the fear, of, A, that Russia will then attack a NATO country and spark Third World War, Article 5, etc. And B, that it will use a nuclear weapon. And... Mm. At the moment, uh, Russia's been rattling its nuclear saber repeatedly. Putin's had exercises. He's moved some nukes into Belarus. And they're just talking about revising the nuclear policy. But what it says is Russia may use first strike nuclear weapons if there is an existential threat to the country. So what do you mean by existential? And I think as a working hypothesis, you can basically take that to mean that Russia believes it's losing. And what is losing look like? I mean, if there's a complete collapse of the Russian army and they are in retreat, that would be losing. But I think at the moment, while they're holding back on these um, long-range missiles for Ukraine, 
mm. is that the White House is scared that losing will look like if you suddenly start hitting all the airfields and missile missile launch sites, pushing back Russia's forces away from the Ukrainian border. That's what Zelensky wants. Okay, so, um, so just to clarify, like Ben, losing, just to clarify, what are the so-called red lines for, for NATO and, and the West today in this conflict, two years on? I mean, we've seen shifts and changes. Uh, the, the, there's clearly been uh, uh, some shifts in, in, in these red lines in the Western position. What is it exactly today? And, you know, how, how do you expect it to evolve? And how much, why has it changed so much? Well, if you look at the policy, I mean, I, I think Dima said it that, you know, there's confusion on the Western side um, that they have supported Ukraine and there has been a steady creeping escalation on both sides. And the weapons, you said in your preamble, you know, that Schultz didn't want to send the Leopard tanks and then did. There's been dragging their heels for ages over the F-16s. Those have just arrived, albeit only 10 of them. But that's the point. They've always sent some, but not enough. Mm. And they've sent 10 planes when Zelensky was asking for 120. And so this creeping ex escalation means we're moving closer to red lines, but it's always being done on the on the Western side so that you don't cross this line, so you don't provoke a war, so that you can continue to say, but we're helping Ukraine defend itself, because the fear is the Kremlin will turn around and say, actually, you're using NATO weapons to attack Russia, and therefore mm. we're entitled to retaliate. And this is why the Kursk incursion was so scary, because you now have Western weapons, Western supplied weapons, inside Russia. And this could, con you know, the Kremlin could take this as an attack on Mother Russia and then retaliate on NATO. Okay. And so we've come up again, we pushed the red line back again. But as I said before, I think the ultimate red line for Putin is if he thinks Russia is losing the war and then he will retaliate. And the White House is trying very hard to make sure that that doesn't appear to be happening. OK, uh, Dimitri, I'll ask you uh, in a moment whether you agree with uh, what uh, Ben Aris has said there about this ultimate uh, red line for, for President Putin. But I just wanted to come back to you, Peter, and ask you your thoughts about what Dimitri said. Uh, he talked about the, the West acting irresponsibly and also ask you why uh, is it that Ukraine has seemingly not been as concerned about Russia's so-called red lines? What, what is emboldened Ukraine? Well, it's emboldened Ukraine, the fact that Russia has, you know, every time that these supposed red lines have been crossed has not really uh, done anything that it hasn't done already since the very start of this war. This terror continually has reigned in our cities, uh, you know, regardless of Kursk or not Kursk. And you know what? Let me just come back to this idea that there's some kind of terrible red line that's been crossed uh, uh, by Ukraine occupying parts of uh, the Kursk uh, territory, similar to what uh, uh, Putin is doing elsewhere in Ukraine. I mean, Putin himself recently suggested that he might be ready for peace talks if Ukraine withdraws from Kursk. Well, how is it, let me ask you, how is it different from Ukraine waging war to uh, reclaim its uh, territory in the Donbass or in Crimea? According to the Russian constitution, these areas are already part of Russia. So is there some kind of a slight distinction, some kind of a Freudian, you know, sort of slip uh, of the rhetoric on the part of Putin? Because because, you know, according to the Constitution, Kursk or Crimea or the Donbass, it's all the same. They're all mm. part of Mother Russia. So it's telling you that even Putin realizes uh, that simply according to international law, there's simply no justification for occupying the territory of Ukraine. The West, the sooner it stops caring about any of Vladimir Putin's red lines, you know, the sooner he will be motivated to come to the negotiating table. Unless Russians start to feel the brunt of this war in their territory, Putin will be enabled to wage this war endlessly. He has enough okay. money to do it as long as Russians don't hear. Let's get Dimitri to respond. Uh, Dimitri, your response to what uh, uh, Peter has just said there. Well, first, we must get our facts straight. Uh, Putin did not say he would have negotiations if uh, Ukraine withdraws from Kursk. After the Ukrainian incursion in Kursk, in the Kursk region, Putin said that there would be no negotiations. Uh, he viewed this as a very dangerous escalation uh, that puts uh, the government of uh, Zelensky, you know, makes it unable to hold negotiations. Uh, I think these are all tragic, tragic uh, developments because uh, the sooner this madness for war ends, the better for everyone. And uh, Putin has been saying before the incursion in Kursk that uh, 
we could have negotiations if Ukraine agrees that these four regions, uh, Donetsk, Lugansk, uh, you know, uh, Zaporozhye and, and, uh, and Kherson, uh, 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 you know, which Russia declared its territory, if uh, they are left uh, to be Russian territory by the mm. Ukrainian side. And now, after the attack against the Kursk region, Putin said uh, that uh, if there will, there will be negotiations, if there are negotiations, the Russian position will be tougher. Uh, the idea to put the war to the homes of Russians, we have heard it many times uh, from many American officials. I think it's not a good idea. It reminds me of the, I'm sorry, of the ideas of Islamist extremists uh, who uh, justified the attack against the United States in 2001, this terrible terrorist attack. Uh, they said that, okay, we have war in the Middle East, we have it in Afghanistan, it is all supported by the United States, let's bring the war to the United States. Uh, mm. That didn't help anyone. I think uh, it was a terrible tragedy, uh, uh, what happened in 2001, but uh, there, there were also several tragedies that followed. Right. You don't do it to a nuclear power. If you if you bring war to the homes of citizens of a nuclear power, something terrible may happen to the whole world. Right. Uh, but but the, 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 think, uh, President Putin has threatened to, to use nuclear power. And, and uh, as uh, uh, Ben said earlier, th there's a talk now in Moscow of, of revising the nuclear doctrine. Is, is it clear what form that revision may take? And just how serious is the Kremlin about this? Well, that's the point. Uh, 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 there is uh, a policy of certain ambiguity, and uh, Russia is not the first country to use this policy of ambiguity. Mm -hmm. The United States was ambiguous about its weapons. Israel has been ambiguous. Many countries are ambiguous about what they're going to do if something happens. So yeah. that's not something new in, in modern politics. Uh, but okay. so far, uh, Russia's actions on nuclear power, they were all about exercises. Here, I agree with Ben. Uh, there, was, there were no real strikes. There was no real use of uh, uh, ter these terrible weapons. Russia just uh, reminded the world, it tries to remind the world that it has these weapons. But the Western okay. officials act as if these weapons never existed. I mean, listen to uh, Joseph Borrell. He, mm. he says that it would be a good idea to lift all restrictions on strikes against Russia. Well, I understand that uh, Joseph Borrell is an old man. Probably he doesn't want to live much longer. Uh, but this is very responsible uh, on the side of the European Union. This okay. is the head let of me, the Let European me ask Union Ben about this, the, this threat, Ben, yeah. of nuclear blackmail. How is it being viewed in Western capital, in Germany, for example? <laughs> People don't like it. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, the, there is a fear that, that Putin could... He's done extreme things at every turn in this war. I mean, just crossing the border being the most extreme right at the beginning. But each time he surprises by choosing extreme options. And so the possibility of him using a nuclear weapon is non-zero. And there's graduations of that too. Russia has these tactical nukes, these kind of small nukes, which they could use, and it would take out the whole of downtown Kiev, but it's not that big, and it's actually do the same amount of damage as a conventional weapon, but it would be nuclear. And so they could do that um, in as a warning. Um, okay. I think the chances of Putin actually using one are very low um, because it would make Russia a pariah forever in history. Um, but just, but know, do you think, Ben, that we're, we're closer now, given the tensions, given the developments we've seen in the last month or so? Are we closer think, to a direct confrontation uh, between, uh, you know, the countries that are helping Ukraine today and Russia? Well, I already said there's been creeping escalation and the lines are getting pushed back. Um, the latest one, I mean, look, to understand this thing with the nuclear weapons, um, the real danger is not that he's going to use one. It's the possibility and then the effect that has. And so you're asking about the effect here in Berlin and, and in Washington. The effect of the possibility has been this partial aid to Ukraine, some but not enough, because in effect, the White House has imposed a no-fly ban over Russia on Ukraine, whereas Russia is, as we saw last week with the massive missile barrage, Russia has freedom to bomb anything and anywhere in Ukraine that it wants to. 
And why would this the U- U.S. follow this perverse policy, refuse permission to use these long-range missiles in inside Russia at legitimate targets that are firing missiles into Ukraine? The reason is it's part of this escalation management policy. Yeah, well, thank you, Ben. What's the risk today, Peter, uh, of of the war spreading and engulfing more countries? And and what direction is Ukraine going to take the war now? Uh, we've seen a, a cabinet reshuffle, a major cabinet reshuffle uh, after the, the the attacks recently. Where is the the war going as far as Ukraine is concerned? Uh, yes. Uh, well, uh, listen, uh, the situation in the east of Ukraine and the Donbass is very uh, continues to be very difficult, etc. But uh, as difficult as it is, uh, keep in mind, Vladimir Putin's goal remains pretty maximalist. And that's controlling the entire territory of Ukraine, making Ukraine a failed state, etc. Uh, simple, simply, uh, I'll, I'll just say that militarily, Vladimir Putin has shown that thir- uh, third year into this war, he's unable to do this. He's huffing and puffing. He's uh, portraying his army as uh, victorious and unbeatable. Kursk has shown that it's not the case. That's been at least one use of this operation. Uh, so uh, the, it is the uh, psychological warfare being waged against Ukrainians, against the West, to try to convince them that no matter what they do, Russia will walk over Ukraine victorious. That is, the I think, where the main uh, battle right now is continuing. Uh, if Ukraine continues to uh, get enough supplies from its uh, soldier, from its uh, uh, allies, if it continues to mount successful recruitment efforts, it will be able to continue, uh, you know, fighting valiantly against uh, the Russian incursion. And once again, I don't see how Vladimir Putin will win this war in the long run unless, you know, we and the West capitulate uh, and start believing, uh, you know, his uh, his lies and, uh, you know, okay. and his uh, sort of make-believe reality that he's trying to impose on us. Uh, Dimitri, I'll give you the the final word. What's the end game now for Russia? And and will Russia fight for complete victory? How how do you see this war ending, basically? Uh, Well, the more uh, uh, the West talks about bringing the war to the homes of Russia, and uh, the more adventurous the actions of the Ukrainian government, such as the incursion of Kursk, the bigger the risk for humanity, not only for Russia and for Ukraine, but for humanity. So I think we should all uh, come back to our senses. Cooler heads should prevail on both sides. And we should stop talking about winning this war. We should start talking about uh, ending the war. Uh, ending the war uh, in, in, in a way that would uh, leave Russia more or less secure because uh, otherwise there will be no end. Russia will not compromise its security because people like Borrell and people like Donald Trump and, uh, and I'm sorry, Joe Biden are on the other side. These people are irresponsible and unpredictable. Okay, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for a great discussion. Dmitry Babich, Peter Zamayev and Ben Aris. Thank you. And thank you, too, for watching. You can always watch this program again anytime by visiting our website at aljazeera.com. For further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And, of course, you can join the conversation on X. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Fully Thibault, and the whole team here in Doha, thank you for watching. Bye for now.